All right. Well, it looks like we have about 26 people or so signed on. So um, I'll introduce Dr. Stallman so she can get us started. So I'm Kirsten Olland. I'm the director of the UW Boise Psychiatry Residency. And today we are lucky to have one of our own, Dr. Stallman, who will be presenting for us on the topic of motherhood and medicine breaking the maternal wall. She did her medical school training at Ohio State University College of Medicine and majored in neurobiology. And she is a fourth year resident in our uh, psychiatry residency track through the University of Washington and is also a chief resident. So I'm happy to welcome her here today and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Stallman for presenting for us. Thank you, Dr. Olland. So hi, everyone. Um, when I was signing up for Grand Rounds earlier in the spring, I did not think that we would still be doing virtual Grand Rounds. So, But we'll make the best with, with what we've got. And it's good to see some familiar names here. Um, so today, we're going to talk about motherhood and medicine. And this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And we'll um, get a chance to talk about why. Um, so my hypothesis going through training and having kids was that women are treated differently in medicine and more so mothers are treated differently in medicine. And so based on this hypothesis, I wanted to do a deep literature dive and look at whether or not there was evidence for this. Um, and so we will spend some time going um, through some of the literature. So our agenda today, we're gonna talk about why are we talking about this? We're gonna focus a little bit on biases and discrimination. Um, we're gonna talk about what the literature says and whether or not there is support for my hypothesis and kind of what the current data shows us. Then we'll go into my personal story and um, looking at, you know, in training what this looks like. So in medical school and, re and in residency. And then finally, we'll spend some time talking about what we can do. So hopefully at the end of this talk, these are the goals and objectives. Hopefully we meet them. Um, I want you to be able to understand that women face unique challenges in medicine and gender inequality is a pervasive institutional, societal, and systemic issue. I want you to understand that the lack of maternity leave in this country has consequences for our public health and for retaining women in the workplace. And finally, I want you to recognize that biases and discrimination definitely exist and furthermore, be able to challenge your own biases and think about that and how it can affect your role as a supervisor or as a trainee. So without further ado, um, I want to start with RBG and 2020 has been such a hard year for all of us. And one of the big losses that we've had um, in 2020 was RBG. And this quote speaks to me very much so. Um, she says, work-life balance was not a term, was a term not yet coined in the years my children were young. When I started law school, my daughter Jane was 14 months. My success in law school, I have no doubt, was largely because of baby Jane. I attended classes and studied diligently until I came home at four o'clock. That was children's hour. It was a total break in my day and children's hour continued until Jane went to sleep. After Jane's bedtime, I returned to the books with renewed will. Each part of my life provided respite from the other and gave me a sense of proportion that classmates trained only in law studies lacked. Having Jane gave me a better sense of what life is. And I think this perfectly captures my experiences with having children and raising kids during my training. And I know finding work-life balance is a professional personal journey for working women anywhere. And not just working women, but the same principle applies to men who are raising children as a primary caregiver or dual resident families where you're splitting these roles. And so I think um, this really captures what we're talking about. Throughout this presentation, I'm going to also have quotes interspersed. These are things that myself or other women have been told directly by either co-residents, by supervisors, by other trainees. And so we'll um, hopefully this also gives us a little um, bit of understanding about what we face. So here is the first one. I wonder if you're distracted or impaired because you're pregnant. Seems like it's hard to do both and will get harder once the baby comes. Have you considered quitting to stay home? And so why is this topic important? I think 
it's a simple question and it's also a very not simple question. It's a very complicated question. Um, there's, you know, there's papers about why it's important to, um, that, it, that we have women in the workforce. There's papers showing that there's better outcomes, um, you know, under the care of women. There's some papers showing that there's evidence for improved collective intelligence when there's um, a higher ratio of women to men. And this is not about sexism, this is about diversity and how do we include um, a diverse group of people into a professional setting. So I think this really captures um, this, you know, what we're talking about. It's this concept of that women um, cumulatively throughout their careers have these micro experience, these micro inequalities. And it's kind of like microaggression, this concept of these little small slights are there and they're kind of um, insidious and then they add up and then you see, you know, women who are not this big salary gap. You see women working part-time more so than men. Um, you see women quitting to stay at home more so than men. And so what is going on? And so looking at, this is a study that looks at male surgery faculty and female surgery faculty. And they surveyed about 50 or so, 54 faculty. And so looking at male surgery faculties, very striking differences. So spouses who worked full-time, 31%, 33% of spouses work part-time and 36% of spouses stayed home. Whereas when you look at female faculty, 100% surveyed has had spouses who worked full-time outside of the home. Looking at um, men more likely to miss family activities because of job demands, looking at women more likely to miss work activities because of family demands men more likely to believe that leaving early and arriving late is a sign of being a good parent, women more likely to believe that these same things had adverse effects on faculty standing and reputation, men more frequently approached for collaboration opportunities, more time spent on advancing careers, women less likely to be approached for collaboration on research projects, and more time spent on administrative tasks. And finally, when they look at men, over 50% of these male surgery faculty surveyed believe that female faculty with kids were less able to meet career demands. And this is the really sad part. When you look at women faculty, 66% believe that female faculty with kids are less likely to meet, meet career demands. And 0% believe this is true of male faculty. And this is another study looking at, they surveyed 5,783 women physicians and asked about, have you faced discrimination, gender discrimination? And 77% reported that they faced any type of discrimination, 66% um, faced gender discrimination and 35.8% reported maternal discrimination. And maternal discrimination is exclusive to um, discrimination relating to breastfeeding and pregnancy and maternity leave. And so when you asked um, these women, you know, have you experienced your pay or benefits were not equal to my peers? I was not fairly considered for a promotion. I was treated with dis disrespect by nursing or other support staff. I was held to a higher standard that, of performance than my peers and I was not included in administrative decision-making tasks. And um, this blue bar shows that of all the women, um, what yes or no, how the percentage of um, women surveyed who experienced these things. And then they looked at um, of the 30 something percent of women who described facing maternal discrimination, yes or no, did they face these, um, these specific things? And the rate is higher for all of them. And then when you're looking at no maternal discrimination, this other group, um, the rate is lower. And so here we're looking at um, whether or not people are, um, you know, what are important workplace changes that they want to make? And these ones are significant. It was people, um, women who did face maternal discrimination in this bar here um, were more likely to want 
longer paid maternity leave. Women who faced maternal discrimination more likely to want backup childcare. Women who faced maternal discrimination more likely to want support for breast milk and pumping. So why are we talking about this? The other big point in this social set, you know, in the setting of racial unrest and what's going on is that gender inequality is just part of this picture. And this wheel is thanks to Dr. Hines um, when he gave a talk about intersectionality and it breaks down, here is privilege and here is oppression and resistance. And when you look at societal factors and identities, um, there are certain characteristics that place people in positions of privilege. And there are characteristics that place people in positions of oppression. And um, this is important because when we look at change, we need to look at systems of power. We need to look at privilege and oppression and whose voices are being heard. And if we do want to change things about women, um, you know, about racial minorities, we need to include their voices. And we also need to include the voices of those in positions of power as well. And that's how change happens. So thank you, Dr. Hines, for sharing this. So there are studies that show that maternal employment has benefits and um, looking at, you know, when you look at working women, and their children, it really shows, you know, in terms of that there are, there are benefits to the children. And so there are studies that show, you know, daughters of, of employed mothers were more likely to be in the workforce. They're more likely to have higher earning potential. They're more likely to earn more and they're more likely to supervise other people. And so, then when we're looking at sons of working mom, they're also more likely to find spouses who are working. And this, you know, the thought is that kids look up to their parents. And when kids see that their moms or their dads are equally contributing to the household, this really makes a long lasting impression that lasts for generations. So, Currently, um, female medical students make up over 50% of, um, of the total matriculants in medical school, which is really awesome. And this trend has been going up and up and up. And here, I think it ends in 2019, but as of 2020, female, females make up 50.5% of medical school students. Yet, when we're looking at practicing attendings across the country, um, by and far, men predominate the practicing attendings. And so um, the, the question is why? And is it, you know, is it that women are, they're graduating from med school, then they're dropping out of residency at higher rates, they're dropping out of um, working at higher rates. And so what is the what is going on? And when we look at Idaho here, it's pretty bad. 25 to 29% of practicing attendings are women. And so the vast majority is men. And when we look at other states that maybe have a higher distribution of women, no, there's no states where it's over 50%. Okay, here's another quote. Now is your chance to learn. It's distracting to have a baby at home. Keeps you from being a good doctor, from being driven, from advancing. All right, when we look at positions of leadership, there are great disparities between men and women. So despite more women being in medical school, we look at, you know, in um, faculty positions, 38% in medical school faculty. 21% are full professors, 15% are department chairs, and 16% are deans. And then in hospital leadership, the people making the decisions, women are 18% of hospital CEOs. When we look at medical journals, people contributing to the scientific literature, women are 10% of senior authors and 7% of editors-in-chief. And the larger picture, slower to advance um, to leadership, slower to achieve promotions. They're, they get less grants, less institutional research funding, less pay in community practice. 
So when we look at the distribution of faculty positions, looking, this is comparing in 1979 to 1999, there has been zero change. And when we look at, so this is assistant professors, assistant professors, associate professors, and full professors. And here's women, here's men, look at the distribution um, of women in faculty positions. And by and large, women remain in assistant professorship and very few relative to men achieve full professorship. professorship. And this has not changed in 30 years. Looking at medical specialties, there are huge gender imbalances. There are female dominated specialties and then there are male dominated specialties. And um, women dominate OBGYN, women dominate pediatrics, um, men dominate by and large the surgical specialties. When we look at the beginning of med school, when you ask women, there's about 50, 50% split in women wanting to go into surgery versus not surgery. And yet women are not going into surgery. And when you ask um, medical students, 72% of women students face discouragement um, from either residents or from faculty that is tied to gender. And when we look at you know, OB and PEDS, why are there women in there? The, these things, taking care of children and helping birth babies, those things are in the role of women and has been since our, you know, since hun for hundreds of years. And so these are acceptable roles for women to have. When we look at the um, salary and women, so the higher percentage of um, women in the specialty, the lower their salary. And there are, you know, Durham is an outlier here. Um, and some might say, you know, women are, these are lower risk, um, these are lower risk specialties, whereas these are higher risk specialties. So of course, you would have higher salaries in the higher risk specialties. And something like surgery has really high risk. And so men are going into surgery. But OB is also a high risk specialty high risk specialty. It's about equivalent to general surgery. But when you look at this line here, the salary difference is still much lower compared to general surgery. So it's not just tied to risk. Looking at the sex differences in physician salary across um, public medical schools in the US, overall female academic physicians make about 20K less um, salary per year than their men, and then not their men, than male counterparts. And this is adjusted you know, for years of experience, for specialty, for the age of the physician. Um, and so you know, this, this is a big problem. And we know that this is not just in medicine. All right, here's another quote. Are you even committed to your patients? That is so unfair to focus on your family when you should be learning to be a doctor. Why is there such a large salary gap? The thought is that maybe there's lower research and clinical productivity among women. There's differences in household responsibilities. There's differences in expectations of raising children. There's difficulty in finding mentors. It's hard for women to find women mentors. There's inequalities in allocating research funding. And we talked a little bit about the disparity in grant funding. There's maybe differential preferences and work-life balance. So maybe women prefer to work less. Why is that? And what is society telling us that then roots this belief? When we're looking at men and women who are equally productive in research and clinical work, so seeing the same amount of patients, producing the same amount of papers, women are less likely to receive re recognition for their achievements. They're more likely to face discrimination and there's, they're less likely to negotiate for higher salary. And this is not just for doctors. Um, there's a great paper um, in NPR that's called the fatherhood bonus and the motherhood penalty. And it talks about parenthood and the gender gap, gender gap in pay. And so 
at every educational level that we look at, and here's advanced degrees, here is, you know, the professional degrees, um, look at this big gap. It, and it's even more so um, in advanced degrees compared to looking at high school, um, just people who, people who have a high school degree, uh, which is really concerning. And looking at women's median salary, um, weekly earnings as a percentage of men and their characteristics. So across all characteristics, women make less than men. And we know that. But when we look here at women who are never married, they make about 90-ish percent um, of their male counterparts. Then we look down here at married women and they're making about 70%. So there's something about being married. There's something about having kids that really, really hurt um, your, your pay. Um, and then here is the weekly earnings as a pro proportion of men's looking at full time. Um, it's gone up a little bit. It's gone up, which is, which is good. And it's still not where it needs to be. So I think in medicine, we're kind of caught in this weird situation. We're supposed to be the experts on um, what is good. So peds, they're supposed to be the experts on kind of um, breastfeeding and um, what is good for, for development of children. Um, in psych, we're supposed to be advocates for maternal and fetal mental health. And Yet there's, you know, there's policies, but the reality is that a lot of policies are, are um, they fall short. And so things like the Affordable Care Act um, stating that employees need to provide lactation facilities and break time to pump. There's, you know, this is for over 50, if the, if the um, company has over 50 employees and a lot of companies don't. There's no formal policy for breaks. Um, a lot of times trainees might not feel empowered to a request time, um, even if there is space or a and a policy for breaks, lactation spaces might not be available or accessible. Um, we know the ACOG and AAP, the OB and um, pediatric societies, we, they're looking, you know, we know that there's adverse health outcomes in women physicians and in children of women physicians. But yet we have lack of flexibility to attend prenatal appointments. Um, most women work until labor to preserve their, their very little maternity leave um, or to minimize resentment from coworkers. Then there's overcompensation because you're worried about being perceived as inadequate. Looking at FMLA, um, 12 weeks of leave with job protection, and this is without pay. So. 12 weeks of leave is great. You can come back to your work, but you're not being paid. And so how many people are actually able to afford to take 12 weeks without pay? Um, the other thing, this ex excludes interns or first year fellows. Um, you need to be at the job for 12 months to qualify. And kind of what we talked about doesn't apply to about 40 to 50% of those in, in the US workforce. Um, there's things about, you know, recommending guaranteed paid leave and, you know, there's penalties with that. Um, you're missing RVUs. There's lower peer evaluations when you come back from leave. Um, and so there's a lot of barriers here. The AAP recommends exclusive breastfeeding for six months and to continue for at least 12 months. And it is really sad um, that we do not provide for accommodations for that and most um, we'll see a little bit later is that most people don't continue, most physicians, because of the lack of leave um, and because of the lack of support, most don't continue breastfeeding for as long as they want. So maternity leave in the U.S. is really, dis is really poor. Um, uh, when you're looking at um, in a worldwide scale, 193 countries within the U.N. have paid parental leave policies. And um, the U.S. is one of eight that does not. And um, it's the only industrial, industrialized nation that does not have standard paid parental leave. 
And at least 50 countries have at, have at least six months paid maternity leave at at least two thirds of their salary. Um, this is including Canada and most countries in Europe. And there's studies that show that extended paid leave of, a, of six months or more um, are associated with higher contribution of women um, to income, so higher pay, more women staying in the workforce, and increased career satisfaction. So this is another um, way that we see, so family leave around the world, um, and then a map here that shows um, maternity, maternal leave, paternal leave. Um, and in the US, here we are, there's no paid leave. So this leaves it to states and some states are making progress. There are, you know, there were five states and then Washington who is um, the sixth state that started in 2020 to have paid leave policies. But um, six out of 50 is pretty terrible. So looking, um, when we look at family leave for academic faculty at the top U.S. medical schools, there is a wide variation in policy and it's up to interpretation, which whenever something is ambiguous like that, um, it never leads to equality. There's constraints at the discretion of the department sometimes, sometimes it's only to primary caregivers, so that excludes um, you know, spouses, it excludes sometimes adoptive parents or um, yeah. And then the mean length of full salary coverage was 8.6 months, despite AAP recommendation for 12 weeks of, sorry, 8.6 weeks, um, despite recommendations from our own AAP, um, the experts and peds for 12 weeks of paid leave. And so um, this is kind of busy here. I mainly want to draw attention to um, the you know, we're looking at the top US medical schools. Here's University of Washington. The, our um, policy here is it's unpaid leave. And the equivalent I would say um, is UCSF. So it's a large state um, academic, highly research focused institution, and they offer 100% paid leave. So I can't allow you to pump in a private room. You could be using this as an excuse to cheat. This was said to me during my, um, when I took step two, I think, and I had to pump in the lobby in front of everyone. So what are the consequences for public health when we don't offer maternity leave? We know that there are poor maternal outcomes and we know that there are poor neonatal and infant outcomes. So when we look at maternal outcomes, um, there's, you know, up until we're looking at six months postpartum of paid leave, there's decrease in depression and postpartum anxiety. We know that maternal depression prevents mother and infant bonding and that then downstream affects cognition of the baby and social and emotional development. We know that the U.S. has highest maternal, mater maternal mortality rates of all developed nations, spending, despite our uh, astronomical spending on our health care. Um, and then less than 12 weeks paid or absence of paid leave, women are more likely to leave their jobs and have trouble re-entering the workforce. And then when we look at infant outcomes or neonatal outcomes, really the ideal length to maximize good outcomes is six to nine pay months of paid leave. Um, this reduces neonatal and infant mortality in high, middle, and low income countries. So sometimes we think it's just low income. This is high income countries as well. Um, the thought is, you know, there's more time to get care. There's more um, time to get interventions that are needed. There's economic benefits. There's less stress in the prenatal period. Um, women are more likely to breastfeed and we know that breastfeeding has um, good outcomes, better outcomes for, for babies in terms of their immune system. And finally, we know that infancy is critical. And in the first year of life, um, there's about 700 new synapses that's being made every second in a baby's brain. And 
this is this is very important and thinking about the role of um, caregivers and the role that maybe parents might play and a mother might play um, you can't help but wonder what what um, we're doing and that this is a disservice to our next generation so Looking, um, when we look at this concept of the maternal wall, it's kind of like um, the glass ceiling, right? And that there is a penalty that women have an experience for, for being in the workforce. And, you know, we have achieved this equality of like, there are more women in the workforce, but the expectation is still that women do more of the things at home. And so, it's, it's a double-edged sword. And so when we're looking um, at time spent on domestic duties for dual full-time working parents, um, women spend about 8.5 more hours per week on domestic duties still. They're more likely to take time off um, when childcare arrangements is disrupted. So when someone is sick, for example, or a nanny is sick, 42.6% of the time it falls, 42.6% of women are taking time off as opposed to men. Um, working part-time, way more women physicians work part-time compared to men. And this gap increases 22.6 um, up to 30.6% of women once there's children involved. When we're looking at um, how much income is lost during leave, in all fields, there's the majority of women lose about 10K worth of income by taking leave. And then finally, when we look at in our society, who is taking on the burden of, of unpaid work, like taking care of a sick uh, parent or being a caregiver for a family member, it is by and large women who are doing that and taking on the burden. And so the estimated, it's about, you know, 148 to 188 billion dollars of informal unpaid care that women are contributing to our society per year. And I want to focus a little bit on special considerations for trainees. Um, this being that I think training is a very, it's kind of, um, it's a very intense period and it really highlights a lot of the disparities and discrimination. And this is what I've had, I've had a lot of experience with too. So I would like to spend some time focusing on this. So she was committed to our service as a third year medical student, even though she was pregnant. A quick refresher on the medical training timeline to kind of, um, for those of us who are a little bit more removed and I can't even, um, yeah, it's just, it's a long journey. So. Uh, Pre-med undergrad, about four years. Then you go to med school. Um, two, the first two years are preclinical, mainly book studying. Then you take step one, which is an eight-hour test. Then you go into third and fourth year, which is rotating through all the different um, clerkships, all the different core specialties. Then you take step two, which is an eight-hour test, and then another eight-hour um, in-person um, it's called CS, and so it, you're being graded on clinical encounters. Then you do residency, and so the first year is your internship. Then you take step three, theoretically, some of us wait later, wait longer. Um, then you do residency, so residency can be anywhere from two to six years. Then fellowship, which is one to three years, and then you become an attending. So the journey is very long. And the reason why we're talking about this is because this medical training journey overlaps with a lot of women's prime childbearing years. Um, and what makes it so hard to have children in medical training? It's very inflexible. You're working long hours. You have zero control over your schedule. It's hard um, to have pumping accommodations and you're rotating at multiple sites. Um, with, with or without access to places to pump and with or without access to refrigerators to keep your breast milk. There's long standardized tests, so eight hours, the step one, two, and three are all eight hours. There's concern about being taken as a serious professional. There's worries about burdening your co-residents or other team members when you take leave. 
there's worries about finances. Um, you're working long hours, you're being paid very little. So how do you afford child, child care and how do you raise your children? There's um, a lot of people delay childbearing and we'll talk a little bit more about that. There's sex disparities and different specialties, short and absent maternity leave and needing to use up all your vacation and sick leave. And so um, then the rest of the year, you don't go on vacation or you can't take any paid sick leave. And then finally, um, for people who are thinking about fellowship, when you take leave and extend training, then what does that mean for the start time of your fellowship? And a lot of people don't want to start, um, don't want to delay fellowship. And so we talk a little bit about this, that residency coincides with childbearing and child rearing for many. And in as early as 1989, the American um, College of Physicians published a position statement saying um, that we need to have standardized parental leave policies because there's more children uh, or there's more women having children in residency. And this was in 1989 and not much change has happened. So about 50% of women now entering medicine have a baby in residency training. So we cannot, um, we cannot avoid this. This is something that needs to be acknowledged and needs to, we need to have policies surrounding it. 85.6% um, of female physicians have spouses employed full-time. And when we look at male physicians, this percentage is lower that more men have women, partners who are women who are staying at home, taking care of kids. Um, and then finally, 40% of women go part-time or leave medicine within six years of finishing residency. And do, it's due to, due to child care and due to wanting to devote more time to family. And I love this quote. It's, you know, we just talked about the timeline and how much investment goes into becoming and attending. And this, I think this is a huge issue and we're losing a lot of women in the workforce who can contribute um, and who can help our patients. And so when you invest more than a decade of your life to learn a skill and you're willing to walk away from that early in your career, so within six years, that's more than a red flag. It's a burning fire. So this is um, a topic I alluded to that's near and dear to my heart. This um, I've had three children in medical training, and I've had a lot of experience with this. And this is my journal that was gifted to me at the beginning of intern year. I've spent so many hours, you know, on call, crying, not having seen my kids for a long time, writing down my thoughts and um, about what can be different and what needs to change. And so every Everyone, a lot of people who know me know that I love Hamilton, and um, this is from one of the songs there. And so I want to talk about this. In some ways, this Grand Rounds has been in the works for five years, for as long as I've been, you know, pre first pregnant with my with my oldest. It's it's been a work in progress. So I want to quickly talk about vulnerability, and I know in medicine we're expected to be stoic, we're expected sometimes to put our own needs and desires uh, to the side and we're expected to be these superhumans. And I don't, I think this does our field a disservice. And what is the expense here? So I think some of this is that, you know, it's been, it's been um, internalized that being vulnerable is unprofessional in some ways or that um, being vulnerable makes you less of a doctor or being vulnerable makes you more of a woman. And um, I think that's that's completely false. I think it's important to share vulnerabilities with each other and that it helps um, foster connections. It helps foster relationships. It helps with patient care. Are you having babies to get out of work? This was said to me when I had, when I was pregnant with my third baby. So here's a little bit about my story. Um, I had Charlie, my first, um, in 2016. This was during third year of medical school. And I took six weeks off. I wanted to graduate on time. And um, 
at the time, having never had kids, I thought six weeks is more than enough. And I've never had six weeks off. And I planned all these projects of things that I wanted to do and what um, what I was going to read and what I was going to work on. And it was just totally mind blowing. It was not like nothing I've ever experienced before. It was all consuming. Um, so I came back after six weeks and that was probably one of the hardest things that I've done. So this was in Columbus, Ohio. We always laugh because all three of um, our kids are born in different states. And it's been a very chaotic um, training journey. So we moved around a lot. Um, so Denna is my daughter. I had her during intern year. Um, I had, this was in Seattle, Washington. It was really rough being pregnant and being an intern. Um, I took 10 weeks off and then I came back onto night float and I was at Harborview Medical Center working 12 hour shifts and taking care of 90 patients and any new consults that come in and working in the um, psych ED. And I wanted to quit. Um, I took, I finished out the night flow and I finished intern year and I took a leave of absence um, after intern year thinking about and reconsidering whether or not I wanted to continue in medicine. So I came back um, and I'm glad I did. I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I had Elliot, my third baby here in Boise, Idaho during um, third year residency. And I had 20 weeks off and that was amazing. And um, Dr. Allen was nothing but supportive. So this is a very funny graph. It's not scientific at all. This is something um, that Nari and I, uh, Dr. Sue and I at the beginning um, of this academic year, we were doing a, a um, what's it called, icebreaker. And so Nari had us kind of write down the highs and lows of our lives in a graphical form. And so I shared this um, and I think it's, it's it's really helpful. It helped me to realize like, wow, what is, <laughs> what have I gone through? And so here's high, here's low. Um, just kind of really briefly, here's some highs. Here's the highs were, um, a pattern showed up. So the highs were when I had my babies and each of the times that I came back was just, it was so difficult. And I don't, um, part of this is, you know, I think, it's hard to leave um, your kids no matter what. But I think the other part of it is that this is, we're working in the system that is very rigid. We're working in the system that is designed, um, historically designed for men. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to be this way where it is so heartbreaking and so unsupportive to come back to work in medicine and to try to prove yourself and to still prove your worth um, after you've had kids during your training. So for kind of some of these reasons that we talked about, a lot of women delay childbearing. This is the norm in medicine. Um, women are less likely to plan to have children in residency than their male resident counterparts. There, when we looked at um, surgery residents, two thirds surveyed had experienced negative attitudes from peer or faculty that in influenced their decision to postpone pregnancy. When we look at um, physicians versus non-physicians, um, women physicians, that when having their first kids, they're about on average 29 years old, almost 30. When we look at non-physicians, about 24 years old. And then having their second kids for women, about 32.6, 32, 33 years old versus 27, 28 years old. And so this has some downstream effects. So infertility is, is a big one. Um, the rate of infertility and involuntary, involuntarily childlessness is much higher in female physicians compared to general US females who are not physicians. So 25% of female physicians experience infertility when they want to have kids. And 53% would have conceived earlier if they knew that they had a risk of infertility. Um, and then even more downstream, we know that um, 
you know, higher ages of, of um, childbearing and having kids has more, there's more complications and there's higher risks. So adverse outcomes, there's higher risk, threatened preterm labor, preterm labor, actual preterm labor, um, placental issues like placental abruption, um, and then women working late into the third trimester, so beyond 37 years, statistically significant babies weigh less, and this has outcomes for baby um, for babies too in their development. So maternity leave in residency, we talked a little bit about it for faculty. It's even worse for residents. Um, the mean maternity leave length is six weeks here. And the mean um, paternity leave length is one week. And 80% um, who are breastfeeding during maternity leave. So during maternity leave, about 80% are breastfeeding and then half discontinue when they return to work. So that's at six weeks for a lot of, for the majority. Um, and then by six months, only 15% 15 of women are breastfeeding and reasons being insufficient time, there's no appropriate place. It can be awkward to ask your attending to pump. Um, and then finally, the other thing is, you know, when women are taking longer time than men, and I've talked with a lot of people who, you know, their partners took zero time or in residency, um, people who their wives are having kids, they're taking no time at all. And what does this mean for the distribution of childcare roles? And what does this mean for, you know, father and child bonding? And it already sets a stage for that women are the ones who should be taking care of kids and that men are just, you know, they, they are not necessary or, you know, men or partners who are, who are the ones who didn't have the, physically have the baby. This is a slide that shows examples of parental leave policies for residents. Um, I just, you know, this is from looking at the different specialties, the American Board of Medical Specialties. I just took four out of four out of many to show the differences and basically that it is determined a lot by the specialty boards and there is no, um, there is no standardized policy. And so there's, when there's ambiguity, this allows for discrimination to seep through. This puts a lot of pressure on program directors in making parental leave determinations. Um, and then looking at, there's also, you know, residency mainly is based on competency and it's based on a time length, but there are some specialties that says, um, you know, it, they don't need to meet a certain time, they need to meet certain milestones. And that's determined by the higher ups. It's determined by supervisors and, um, and um, program directors. And so that is very ambiguous. Um, for psychiatry, there's no maximum given, um, but, you know, there's the four weeks should be averaged over a four-year training period. Um, for dermatology, there's six weeks maximum, and then also they can be approved for that they don't need to really make up the time if they're approved to have met certain competencies. So it's just all over the place. Um, there's no standardization, which is which is really hard. And um, thinking about the position paper in 1989, we were already calling for the need for standardized policies then. So here is one. Um, I know you are considering vascular surgery. You have a family, right? You shouldn't go into vascular unless you love surgery more than you love your family. So surgical residents, um, surgery, surgical residents go through a really hard training. Um, when we look at 347 general surgeon residents who are pregnant in residency, 39.39% 39 seriously considered leaving residency and 30% would advise female medical students against pursuing surgery. And so this is a big red flag or maybe a burning fire. And the question is why? Um, here are some more statistics. It's, you know, the, the long and short of it is that 
there's um, this pressure to work unmodifiable schedules up until delivery. Um, there's, you know, as a trainee, you're witnessing or hearing faculty members or co-residents say negative comments about pregnancy or having children, um, the lack of maternity leave, feeling uncomfortable about asking to pump, and 58% stop breastfeeding earlier than they wished. And then this is, this is ridiculous. Um, when they look at surgical program directors, 60% of surgical directors, and I think they surveyed a lot, um, believed that motherhood ad adversely affects a trainee's work. And so this is a top down issue. A little bit about um, implicit gender and maternal bias. When we look, um, these are great papers and we're looking at um, resident assessment and so how they're scored compared to counterparts and really what shows up here is that um, gender biases affect the assessment of residents' competency and achievement of milestones. Um, male residents score higher by both men and female faculty during their training. Um, and the breakdown was that during, they looked at um, internal medicine residents, so three-year residents. Um, in intern year, men and women scored equally. They were, you know, 50-50. And then as training progresses, you look at third-year residents, um, the male residents were finishing with much higher scores than their female counterparts. And the thought is that um, as people progress in residency, they're expected to have higher leadership skills and to be more of a leader, more of a leader. And as a society, we're more comfortable with women exhibiting leadership qualities. And so men um, are assertive and competent and women are expected to be nurturing and emotional. And when, as women progress in residency and, you know, become chief residents or become senior residents, um, this nurturing and emotional role maybe does not fit with what we expect of leaders. Um, and so th there's this likability penalty that I think um, a lot of women have experienced where assertive women um, in leadership can be seen as aggressive and less liked. They might be held to a higher standard or under additional scrutiny by colleagues um, or by, by their superiors. And the flip side is that assertive men are seen as good leaders. So that, I think that is a societal problem. Um, there's gendered expectations. We talked a, a little about that. Um, women returning from maternity leave, when they break that down, they receive lower evaluation scores than before maternity leave. So there's definitely a penalty, um, even as, as residents, um, in terms of how you're being evaluated for having a child during training. Um, there's microaggressions and being treated less formally than their male counterparts, um, not being offered leadership positions or being asked to collaborate in, in research studies because we're assuming that mothers don't have enough time or they want to spend more time with their kids. And finally, honestly, our words really matter. Um, the language in which we use to speak about our women colleagues and trainees and about their achievements, these things can perpetuate very powerful biases. And so I urge you, um, whether you're a trainee or a supervisor or in a position of leadership to think carefully about um, how you talk about one another and think about if there's discrimination or biases that are playing into this. Like for example, um, one thing that showed up in a paper was that um, when mothers show up late to, to a meeting, they're assumed that um, they don't have childcare under control or that they don't, um, they don't value work as much. And then when males, um, when men show up late to a meeting, they're assumed that um, they were busy with another work 
thing. And so, um, so this is an example of kind of the additional scrutiny that women and maybe even more so that mothers face um, in, in the workforce. These two slides are um, kind of busy. I'm not gonna go over it. These are the slides that show um, from these papers about the, the um, assessments that female and male residents um, get from looking at third, first year, second year, third year, and then what core competency we're looking at. So if you're interested, you can go back to, to these graphs. So word on professionalism. Um, this is a great paper. I see that we're running a little low on time. So this is a great paper. It talks about how professionalism is used often as a weapon and um, it is used to keep medicine rigid and conforming to the standards of the powerful and um, the standards of the privileged and that this upholds the tradition of usually generally um, wealthy white men in positions of power. And so professionalism can really be used as something that is discriminatory. Lucky you to get out of rounds because you have to pump. So what keeps women in medicine there are so many things that um, have are you know work against women in medicine, and some of the reasons that women stay, you might think like, why would women just leave, right? Why wouldn't they just leave? This is so much to deal with, um, and for the same reasons that men stay in medicine. And furthermore, maybe you know we have this this. Um, perspective of recognizing issues within the system and achieving positions of leadership to try to make a difference. So how do we break the maternal wall? These are some thoughts that I've had um, that I wrote in my little journal. And in the end, it comes down to that we need more flexibility. Um, we need to have safety plans for accommodating pregnancy. Um, and maternity leave. And we need to encourage paternity leave. We need to make sure that we have accessible pumping facilities and we need to keep talking about this. And in the literature, there's, there's you know, really fascinating things. The long and short of it is that maybe um, we need to have mentorship and we need to have women advance in positions of leadership and that we need to uphold, uphold those voices. Um, this is kind of interesting looking at tackling biases and discrimination. And we know that it is pervasive. It shows up in how people are evaluated. And so what about if we do a blinded review of clinical and academic work and remove the gender factor from, from um, productivity and from how we assess people? So there are changing policies. This is, um, this is great. There are, you know, there's things that are going on here. We need to, and this is becoming more and more um, prevalent as we continue to talk about this. And there's promising moves in the right direction. So the union that the UW is part of, as of 2020, six months of parental leave is now available. So this is great. Um, the ABMS, the Board of Medical Specialty starting in 2021 allows for um, time away for parental leave without it needing to extend training. So there's there's good change being made. And I hope to leave you on that um, that positive note. Here are some references. And I know um, this ran a couple of minutes late. I welcome, I'm, I'm gonna stay for a few minutes longer if um, you have any comments or questions and then otherwise you can always email me and I'm, this is a passion of mine. I'm ha happy to talk about this anytime. So thank you for your attendance. It's a quiet group and I wonder if some people are having to get off to do clinical duties, but I'll just say thank you for that presentation, Dr. Stallman. It's something, you know, I had, a, I waited until after training to have, to start my family and um, took a little bit longer to conceive than I thought it would and hadn't really thought about fertility. And um, so this is something that hits a kind of close to home for me and I think a topic that's really important to think about. So thanks for bringing it up and discussing it with us today. Thank you.
All right. Thank you all. Have a good holidays and the rest of the year. Bye. Thanks, Eunice. It was great. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry, I'm on my admin day at home. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to say there was an article I read that was really good that was talking about, or maybe it was a TV show, I can't remember, that was talking about these discrepancies. Um, and it was looking at different um, places around the world that have implemented new strategies. I feel like it was Iceland or somewhere, I can't remember exactly, but instead of saying um, that women get paid maternity leave or saying there was so much of time or whatever, because they found that when they implemented that, it actually, um, it actually probably led to maybe more men being hired than women because oh. they have to give them like three to six months off and it's, paid. Yeah. then they were finding that preferentially that employers were saying, maybe we don't need to hire these women. Who yeah. Are childhood bearing years. So what they did is they changed um, the wording and they changed the actual laws to say basically maternity slash paternity leave anybody who has a kid whether mm -hmm. you're the mom or the dad could take leave and basically that limited um, companies or employers ability to discriminate against women and actually mm -hmm. led to, um, I think what they found was that it's actually been better for the country overall like men have been taking the leave women have been taking the leave it's better for the family overall mm -hmm. if you have that are be able to provide support. Um, so it was something really interesting that I had never thought about that it's something maybe um, good to keep in mind when we're looking at this because it's yeah. not getting the lead for us. It's talking about maybe what that will mean if you're yeah. writing for women, right? Yeah, right. Um, and so I think the problem too is it needs to be kind of a societal change because you could offer um, that for men and women. And if overall it's and it feels more acceptable for women to take leave and men don't take it, then that is still um, leaves room, right? For for that to permeate. So I, I think well, after yeah. all my call to try to get pregnant because it was that push pull of um, you know, not wanting to dump on people or not yeah. wanting to um, you're putting more work onto others because we had 24 hour call night flow, we had all this different stuff. So it was a lot of, um, a lot of coverage issues. Yeah, um, kind of seeing how it worked when other people had taken off, you know, they had preeclampsia or c mm -hmm. or their baby had failure to thrive seeing. Um, there was a lot of support for that. But there was also kind of like, I think at some point kind of resident burnout too, right? Of yeah, cover all these calls and do all that. Yeah. And I that's something that should be um, addressed in residency as well. How do, again, going back to your slideshow, how do we balance that and how do we provide support and make people not feel like it's it's on them, basically, mm -hmm. offer for life issues. Um, yeah. yeah. I got really sick and I had to take off April to June in my residency my, uh -huh. my last year because I got really sick and they were super supportive and yeah. and it's really stressful not being maybe not being able to have insurance maybe not being able to get paid not being able yeah. to mm -hmm. so um they were super nice and extended my residency they didn't mm -hmm. have um, mm. like otherwise I what do you want I what am I gonna do you know what can I yeah do? what can I do but this is really stressful and whatever so super yeah. good talk. I think it was um you delivered it really well and a lot of interesting things for us to think about because it is a yeah really topic, you know yeah thank you a lot of advice, so yeah so, anywho thank you thank you bye, bye.